Welcome to Effective Code, a podcast for developers exploring the skills and tools needed to make effective code-related decisions and to become more productive by focusing on the essentials. Today we'll be expanding on the subject of groups in Linux. The aim is to provide you with better intuition on how they work and how we can use them in particular situations. We'll also briefly discuss the relationship between groups and file permissions and how we might limit their privileges. In addition, we'll be covering some of the technicalities, such as creating groups and adding users to them, but we'll mainly focus on improving our understanding of groups in general. The purpose of groups. Linux was designed to handle concurrent users. If multiple users can make use of a single system, then there must be a way for users to collaborate. And this is where groups come into play. Groups gives us the power to determine what privileges a set of users has over specific resources, allowing multiple users to securely operate on the same files based on clearly defined boundaries and limitations. A Linux system has different types of users, such as super or root users, normal users, and system users, usually used for background processes. But fundamentally, they are all the same, aside from the influence they possess. In essence, groups determine the authority a user has over certain system resources. Being it a running system process or a normal user account trying to make file changes. How we manage groups in Linux. In Linux, each group is uniquely identified by a GID, just as the users are identified by a UID. When a user is created, they are automatically given a primary group. Usually, this group is named the same as their login or username. A Linux user can only have one primary group and zero or more secondary groups. When we discuss the management of groups in the next few sections, we are talking about secondary groups. Creating and removing groups. In order to create a new group, we must have super user privileges. We can, of course, use sudo to achieve this on most Linux distributions. The command we need to use is called group add. We can add a new group by running the following. sudo group add followed by your group name. To remove a group, we can use the group del command like so. sudo group del followed by the group name. All groups are added to a group file located at forward slash etc forward slash group. So we can check if newly added groups have successfully been created by performing a quick grep search. Obviously, this is not needed, but it's useful to know where the group data is stored, especially when dealing with other common debugging situations. Nevertheless, you can check it by running the following cat forward slash etc forward slash group, followed by a pipe, grep, and a group name. Adding, removing, or moving a user between groups. To add a user to a group, we'll need root privileges. We can add a user to a group by using the user mod command. We can run this command as follows, sudo usermod hyphen lowercase a capital case g the group name and then the username. When we called the command we passed in two arguments, lowercase a and uppercase g. The uppercase g stands for groups and the lowercase a forces the command to append the user to a given group without removing them from all other secondary groups. This might seem strange at first. But when we think of things from an administrative perspective, this actually makes a lot of sense. It allows us to assign a user to specific groups and at the same time exclude them from others, essentially allowing us to move them across groups. Here's an example of adding a user to specific secondary groups. We can still make use of the user mod command followed by a hyphen capital G. Then we can separate the groups by comma. So for example, we'll go group A, comma, group B, comma, group C, followed by the username. Listing a user's groups. When managing user groups, it's useful to check what groups a specific user belongs to. We can achieve this in a variety of ways, but I recommend using the id command. This command prints the user and group ids for a particular user. We can use the command as follows, id followed by the username. The relationship between groups and file permissions. Before heading into a practical example of using groups, it's important to briefly mention file permissions. 
Without a good understanding of file permissions, it would be very difficult for anyone to make any meaningful use of groups. Groups are one of the three main aspects of file permissions. In Linux, each file has permissions set for the owner, group and world. When we set a file's permissions using chmod, we get to define the privileges a group has in terms of reading, writing and executing a file. As we might already know, a directory in Linux is just a file, but the permissions of standard files and directories do in fact differ, and it's important to understand these core differences in order to make effective use of groups. Here's a brief comparison between file and directory permissions. For files, read permissions read the contents of a file. Write permissions change the contents of the file, and execute permissions runs the file as a program. For directories, read permissions lists the files and subdirectories. Write permissions creates, removes files or subdirectories, and execute permissions allows the traversal of the directory. Setting up a directory for user collaboration. Let's imagine that on our Linux system, there's three developers, John, Eric, and Dan. John wants to create a folder named projects in his home directory that both Eric and Dan can also access and work in. John will set up the folder and its permissions like so. He creates the projects directory and changes its permissions to the following. For users, they'll have read, write, and execute permissions. Groups will have read and write permissions, including the special permission set GID. And for others, or world, there will be no permissions at all. The set GID bit makes executables run under group privileges. We won't be covering special permissions here, but feel free to do some more research if needed. John also needs to make sure that Eric and Dan can access his home directory. He decides to give the world read and execute permissions on his home folder. He sets the permissions of his home folder as follows. For users, they have read, write and execute permissions. Groups have no permissions. And others or world has read and execute permissions. Next, he creates a new group called developers and adds himself, Eric and Dan to it. He uses the command group add to add the new group and then uses user mod to add himself, Eric and Dan to this group. Finally, John just needs to change the group of the project's directory. He does this using the chown command. He runs chown john colon developers followed by the path to the projects folder. Everything is now done. Eric and Dan can now freely read, write and execute files and subdirectories inside the projects folder. Also, please note, sometimes group changes does not take immediate effect and a user might need to first log out and back in. Be sure to use the id command to check a user's groups when facing permission issues. Conclusion I hope that the following helped you better understand the idea behind groups and how to make use of them in Linux. I'll also like to encourage people new to the world of Linux to take a look at related topics, such as special file permissions or groups used by background processes. Thanks for reading, listening or watching. We really do appreciate it. To get notified about future content, please subscribe to our newsletter, YouTube channel or podcast. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Music